Hello, I'm Luca De Giglio, and this is the Web3 in Travel podcast, where you can learn about crypto, blockchain, and how the new internet will change travel. Hi, everyone. Welcome to this new episode of Web3 in Travel podcast. Today, we have Simon Talling smith from the startup Void Travel, one of the finalists of the Tech Trees um, first batch. Uh, we, we met twice this year uh, in Umbria at the Web3 in Travel conference, where they were semi-finalists, and, and then again in, uh, in Switzerland uh, at Zug at the uh, Crypto Valley Summit, where they were finalists. So um, very, very briefly, I'm going to introduce uh, what Void does, and then and then I leave it to, to Simon to, to tell us a bit more about that. Mm, in, in very short, very simply, it's about loyalty. So loyalty points, tokenized loyalty points. Uh, the, the problem they are trying to solve is uh, letting us spend those points we can never actually spend. Uh, so something in the same area as, as what we had with me protocol in a couple of episodes back, episodes back, uh, but in a different way. So different technology, different approach, which kind of shows us, you know, loyalty points are a big thing in travel. And there's many ways we are kind of trying to solve this problem. So Simon, sorry for butchering the idea. I really needed to, to have it very simple first. Um, so maybe you kindly present yourself to, to the audience and then talk a little bit about Voy. Thank yeah. you and welcome. Thanks, Luca. And uh, it's really great to be here with, with you on the podcast today. Um, and I should say thank you as well for um, having Voy uh, in the Tetris competition. Um, both in Italy and in Zoo, we really enjoyed that. And we learned a lot um, from the process and, and from the guidance that you guys gave us. So, you know, big thumbs up for that. Um, you gave a pretty good summary of why, actually. We should recruit you onto our marketing team sometime. <laughs> All right, I'm open. <laughs> um, yeah, so, you know, like you said, there's a big problem out there, and that is that people are generally dissatisfied with loyalty, um, even though it's been around us, it's been part of the world of travel, or part of the furniture, really, for decades now but people find that it's hard to understand how they're going to earn the points and much worse hard to spend the points there's too many restrictions on when you can and when you can't spend the points and you seem to have sort of assemble these little pockets of points in different programs that are never quite enough you can't get to your first room night you can't get to your first um car rental etc etc and so you know when, when you add all of that up it's actually a huge problem in the us alone there's a hundred billion dollars, billion with a B, right? A hundred billion dollars of unused loyalty points. And um, imagine what that would be like if you scared around the whole world. So I think people are sort of like voting with their wallets, right? They're not happy with the situation, so they're not using their points. We thought we could fix that. Uh, and we thought Web3 really gave a lot of the toolkit to be able to fix that. Um, both with the ability to create a single universal loyalty point, loyalty currency, call it what you like, um, based in the sort of Web3 ecosystem. Uh, secondly, to be able to allow people to aggregate their little pockets of currency or these little lost points that they're not quite sure where they are and how many there are, aggregate all of those into one place so they've actually got the power to spend them. And then thirdly, to allow them to spend those points straight away and to achieve, for example, discounts on a hotel stay right away after they've aggregated their points. And um, and that's what VOI does at its base level. That's the, the basic proposition of VOI. You know, create a currency, aggregate your lost points into it, and spend it on travel. Okay, so before we go on the how, um, let's stay a bit on on the why. So why, do, why don't they work in, in Web2? Why the, the companies make it hard for me to actually spend my 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 points, which could be my miles, for instance, on an airline. Um, because there's always this doubt, maybe it's what they want. Maybe this is the situation which they actually want, uh, in which you desperately try to collect points. And so you book with them, you use their services, until when it's too late, you realize it was just uh, smoke and mirrors. 
uh, because of course, I mean, let's say uh, an airline could say you need 100,000 miles to get a free flight. Let's simplify again, right? And you don't know how many, you know, you don't really know how long it takes to that. You could calculate it, why not? You know, but you don't do it. And um, and then you, when you collect 20,000 after the many flights, you say, okay, well, this is going to take too long. I'm going to give up. That's what I did, right? You start to stop even paying attention to these points. But in the meantime, they got my my bookings. I could have booked it elsewhere. Maybe sometimes I even paid more money to get more bookings. Sorry, to get more miles or whatever. And it's kind of a rug pull, like in crypto, right? Uh, there's a promise and then the it's unless you really know that the inner workings, you don't realize where and how they're going to be, you know, rug pulled. Um, so the question again is, do companies, I mean, they could fix it very easily, like make it less points, make them not expirable and just give me stuff sooner. They don't do that. It's not by my mistake. It's by, you know, uh, that's their strategy. Uh, why would they change the system um, if they're happy with this? And of course, I'm not. I'm assuming they're happy with it, but probably not. So, I'm sure you heard this question a thousand times. So, yeah, why yeah. would they accept this new, new, new? I mean, it's new a great thing? question, isn't it? Right, because lo loyalty is probably the single biggest, white, most widespread marketing tool that exists in the travel industry uh, in terms of relationship marketing. Beyond, of course, straightforward, you know, digital, digital marketing, which is the bulk of it. But in terms of relationship marketing, it's all powered by loyalty, and uh, it, it's been powered by loyalty for maybe um, I don't know when did it really start? Like early eighties, right? So you know, decades and decades. How come they haven't got it right? I th it's a complex problem. I would say one of the biggest things is that there is an inherent tension inside the organizations, the, the airlines and the hotel groups, about, you know, is a loyalty booking a good thing or a bad thing? Right? Um, the people who don't like it think, well, you're just we're just giving something away that otherwise we would have got real money for. Hmm. And um, and therefore, it's sort of like a second class booking. And the people who do like it say, no, no, wait, there, we've, we've accrued a liability for this booking. And so, you know, we, we've um, we've paid for the cost of it. Through our liability, and secondly, there is very well established research. Uh, that, uh, let me interrupt you here. What do you mean exactly? Because it, this is like oh, yeah. bookkeeping stuff, right? It's right, liability, right, right. and so, you pay for the liability. What does exactly. it mean? So, uh, uh, thanks, look I, I kind of mm. skipped um, way ahead. And then, so uh, at its simplest, you know, let's take an airline, right? They're giving out points, and they're giving out points effectively for free to them, because when you come to redeem those points with them, same airline, right? let's say BA is giving out points and someone wants to redeem back on BA, they've just got to make a seat available. And it sort of so it doesn't really cost them anything. But the accountants don't allow that anymore. They stopped that quite a long time ago. And they said, well, it does cost you something, right? It costs you, you know, the, the the cost of carriage right for the person to travel. well it costs you sorry to to go deep into this because it's very yeah. very important right it costs you the fact yes because one extra body means more of, correct we have more correct. kerosene whatever it is exactly. and all the other expenses the and other also stuff. because there may be a full plane and you're not selling a, a ticket right and exactly right so there's two things okay. there's, a, there's an actual cost like you know, fuel food airport costs right. and then there's an opportunity cost okay. and so. There's very complex um, accounting mathematics that works out. Therefore, given all of that, what is the liability that the airline needs to hold on to toward, for one day to pay for that? When, when all those miles are finally enough to book your ticket from you know, Rome to Paris, how much is that going to cost us? And how much should we therefore accrue, keep to one side in liability? To pay for that and, and by the way they also include the fact that sometimes the points don't get used so they have a, a kind of breakage on that so really really because you're talking here about billions of dollars and so they have to get it right so right. so sorry again when you said the 100 billion dollars is this the after all these calculations or the, the the nominal value like you know just explain to who's listening if i can get a thousand dollar ticket uh 
Is this a thousand dollar liability or is a hundred dollar liability because there's a ten percent chance that they're going to actually use the ticket, etc. Which one of those is the hundred billion? Um, okay, um, two different questions, right? Let, let me take mm. let me take on the thousand versus the hundred question first. So um, it's nearer to a hundred is the answer, uh, maybe okay. a little bit less, and that's based on the fact that when an airline sells you what well, sells one extra seat on a plane that was already going for thousand dollars it doesn't it definitely doesn't cost them a thousand dollars for that seat right it probably only cost them one or two hundred dollars for that seat maybe, maybe less um so the marginal cost of carry um is what is important here and then secondly uh as you rightly said there's a chance that they won't use it so if only 50 percent of people ever use their miles then then they will discount that cost accordingly so one way or another the airlines can work out how much they need to put to one side for liability. Okay. Now, this is where it gets really um, kind of confusing with the world of loyalty points because loyalty points, they're so widespread now that it's generally accepted they have a value. Mm. In fact, they have several different values, right? So they have a value to you, the consumer, because you think, hey, it's going to cost me this much to buy a ticket. And let's say it's going to cost me uh, 100 euros to buy a ticket. And uh, the airline wants, um, let's say they want 10,000 miles for that. Okay. So you could say for me, the value of that mile was 100 euros divided by 10,000, which is what 0 yeah. 0 0.01, no, 0 0.1 euros, right? Uh, the airline sees a different value. The airline sees its liability, which is way less than that, maybe maybe a tenth of that. And in between, there's a whole bunch of values where the airlines and car companies may trade points between each other. So if you say you want to buy some points, I want to sell some points, there'll be values for those. The $100 billion, as far as I can see, that number comes from the consumer's perceived value. Right, so the consumer. Oh, okay. So there'll be the higher side, but there's on the higher not side, not full. Okay. Okay. Um, but nevertheless, the, the 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 other, even on the lower side of liability, the airlines are all carrying the big airlines billions of dollars of liability. Right. Okay. Big miles. Now, again, why does it matter to, for a non-technical person that you have liabilities? Why would they be happy to? You know, not have those liabilities on their balance sheet, right? Because that's exactly right. You, your your the health of your company. If anyone looks at your company, maybe they're an investor, right? Maybe right. Um, it's a, a finance company that's going to lend you some money. If you're an airline, okay. every time you want to buy an aircraft, people are going to be so all your shares your are worthless. If you sell the company, it's worthless. Exactly. It's, it's yeah, like something you really say, want to get rid of. Okay. Yeah. How come you've got? one billion of assets and two billion of liabilities that looks worrying to us and right, so okay. all cfos will want to keep the liabilities under control so the cfos are the ones who want to expire the miles the cfos right? will want to expire the miles in terms of they want to they want to see the liabilities come down exactly right the right. the sales the revenue people generally will want to sell um normal paid tickets rather than mileage tickets because they're getting okay. more revenue on, onto their targets. Yeah. And finally, the marketing people will want people to use their miles because there's really good research that says people who use their miles turn out to be two or three times more engaged as mm. a consumer than people who don't. And people who don't just become sort of ghost customers that go away and nobody knows where they've gone and what, why. But if people are using the miles, then you know they're active. And in any business, active customers are a good thing. Okay, so this is like, like the politicians uh, printing money to make their electorate happy. In a way. Yeah. The marketing people, right? Give, give, give away yeah. freebies and you're going to have happy customers. All right. So, okay. Apologies for getting too deep into this, but I understand now. So liability, they don't want liabil liabilities. There's tensions amongst these different constituency in the company. So you come in and say, okay, let's make, let's tokenize them. Let's make it easier for customers to, to use them. So you make the marketing people, is that correct? That you make the marketing people happy and the other two not too happy. 
Is that the... Um, actually, probably the other way around. Um, All right. Oh yeah, liabilities go away. Yeah, yeah. Okay, exactly. Go ahead. So, so uh, our end game will be that people who are just not using, they're inactive, they're not using their miles, will say, "Hey, I'm better off aggregating this into VoI and having a bigger pile of VoI points because then I can use those for the vacations I want to take." Um, so, in that case. Uh, the CFO is probably going to be happy because they can reduce their liability. That's the easiest thing. And, and yeah, we're talking quite a lot of money. So it, it, it becomes a non-liability the moment it gets, uh, when exactly it stops being a liability in case of cooperation with VOI. So in the case of cooperation of VOI, when the company has agreed to, when, when the company understands that one of its members has transferred its po their points out of, the airline and into VOI and said, okay, well, I've got, I've got, let's just say 20,000 Avios. I can't do much with that. So I'd like to change them into VOI and VOI will give them the VOI number of VOI points equivalent of 20,000 Avios, which actually quite a lot less, um, but let's call it 2000. So we give you 2000 VOI. There's just an exchange rate. You've got real good value with your 2000 VOI and you've burnt up your 20,000 Avios. Um, at that point, we can notify Avios and say, hey, you know, this guy Simon just burnt up 20,000 of his points onto VOI. Uh, or, or we can do that every month or whatever. But we can tell them that a substantial amount of the points have been burnt up. And at that point, they can just wipe them off their own books, take the points out of the system and reduce the liability. Why? Because, I mean, those points are still out there. Somebody's going to use them. No, the points, uh, the, the points, they're out there, but they're not, they're not Avios anymore. They're now void. So we hold the liability for them. Okay. Uh, but somebody will, point, yeah, somebody could use their, off. somebody could use the, the okay. The, so liability is gone, but then it becomes void points, uh, which are in the hands of the customer. Yes. It customer is. could go to another company and use those void points to buy yeah. real, real stuff. In yep. the same way, somebody could have gotten VoIP points from another airline and used them on my airline. And I don't have liabilities, but now I have a customer who doesn't want to pay but wants the service. Is this a good... Ah, okay. So this is okay. one of the other really important thing. Generally, when people are redeeming their points on another airline or another hotel or something, it's not actually the points that are moving. So... If I say, okay, I'd like to now use these points at Marriott, what's actually happening is that Marriott have given whoever, in this case it's VOI, a price in dollars that they'll sell the room at for a VOI customer using VOI points. And VOI will pay that amount and deduct the points from the user's account. So the, the, the VOI points would never go to Marriott any more than it's any more than a bon, bon void point would ever go from Marriott. Yeah, to, no, no points, but like. Marriott is going to have, or anyway, when somebody's part of one of these point swapping schemes like like uh, Boy or Me, Me Protocol, etc. Yes, you're giving away your your mile. So your customer gives away his miles or her yes. miles, right? So you're done. You you with these customers, you're okay. Cannot come back to claim miles. Some other customer you've never seen before comes and says, well, I got these points, which represent some, you know, I can use them in your company. So give me a free seat. Uh, so yeah, the points have, have gone away from the liabilities, but now you have uh, somebody who wants something for free. Is that correct? Quite, actually, no, that's, uh, that's the good thing for the companies here. All so right. when someone wants to use their void points, and this is the same as any loyalty program, when they want to use their void points, they make a booking on the void platform. So VOI makes the booking, right? Uh, we, well, I mean, we use a third party, but it's on the VOI platform. And we have an agreed price that we will pay the supplier, airline or hotel or cruise or whatever, in dollars, right? Fiat currency. So they, go, they do get money. So they is do it get a money. fraction? Is no, like, of course, it's a fraction of the real nominal it's price. It's a pretty high fraction, yeah. They, they, they will have, like, they might offer, say, a, a 20 or 30% discount on the retail price. Oh, right. So it's pretty high. It's much more than the value of the points on the, uh, exactly. on the uh, as a liability. All right. 
yeah. So yeah. where does where does the miracle happen here? Because it looks like you're moving money around, and then suddenly everybody is happy. But I yeah. I don't think nobody can ever you cannot make everybody happy. Somebody's losing, right? Yeah. So um, what is happening here? So the 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 reason that the loyalty world works is that there is a always going to be a margin between what the customer perceives the value of their redemption. So either they're using their points for a free trip okay. or increasingly, and often in the case of Voy, they're using it for a discount. So they thought mm. they were going to have to pay $1,000 for a weekend stay. And now they only have to pay $700 for a weekend stay. But the margin is higher. So the company actually is making still some money on that. It's a bit like when you go to a supermarket and they tell you, three for the price of two right exactly. and you pay that price and this is still more than what the three cost to them right but they have they have acquired a customer and this customer would have cost them money the famous cac CAC, you know customer exactly. value and even if they make less margin they still acquired a customer so it still makes sense in a way exactly so i it, it's that correct uh, interpretation yeah yeah and, and the other thing for the companies is that you know, most most companies are, and travel is a really good example of this, are engaged in this sort of constant um, decision making as to when they should discount, how much should be discounted, who should they discount to. Yeah. And the risk, of course, is dilution. Right? You don't want to discount your main product on peak times of the year. Exactly. Everyone yeah, yeah, yeah. want to discount. Right. And that's why they're very attracted to what the industry would describe as a closed user group discount but when only some people can access it and it looks effectively opaque to those people, they don't really realize they're getting that discount because it's been made opaque in some way. And loyalty is a really good vehicle for that because the customer thinks, well, I'm paying a bit of cash. I'm using some of these points. I'm glad to use my points. I've got, you know, I've got a holiday stay now for less than I would have paid in cash uh, All great. But the next guy who just wants to buy that hotel room and he wants to buy cash, he never says, oh, well, why, why can't I get it for that price? Because he's not a member of the loyalty program and he hasn't got any. Yeah, he, he can't buy them on the market, can he? Correct. They're not on the open market. Yeah. So, all right. That, that's what kind of protects the whole the whole thing. They're not on the open market. Exactly. So just before I go in the hotel, I buy some points and... And I get them a discount, which yeah. otherwise I wouldn't have gotten. Yeah. Okay. But I think all the right. important thing here is that... Look, there were some very uh, detailed and complex economics going on behind the scenes with loyalty. Yeah. Of course, because there's so much money, there's bound to develop these kind of dynamics. What we're trying to do at VOI is keep that simple for the consumers. The consumers don't need to know about that. right? They, they don't even want to know about that. What they want to know is, can I use these points from other programs that were useless to me? And am I going to get a good deal on a holiday that I buy? And, and that's what we try to deliver. Could, could this be? Let, let me see if I if I get it. Um, today, uh, as a as a customer, I am exposed to these, let's say, dynamics you mentioned, right? So I'm exposed by them to them by the fact that, for instance, suddenly I get an email with my my mind expired, or before I could get you know business class uh, upgrade for ten thousand miles from London to New York. Now it cost me twenty thousand. So I kind of have, I'm exposed to the fact that. These loyalty points depend a lot on when I book, where I book, et cetera, et cetera. With Voy, you you kind of protect me from all this. Uh, protect me in the sense you, you don't expose me anymore to these unpleasant situations. But the game is still played in the number of points which which are needed. So there That's is still right. flexibility that, for the companies. Right, but, yeah. but with Voy, we have a sort of open-ended part effectively part cash part void points so if you've only got a small number of void points you can still use them you're just going to have to use a bit more cash to go with them right right so so you don't get you don't get stuck in the situation where you've got this kind of useless pocket of points somewhere that just not enough to do anything with because now you can use them and you and, and partly because you've brought them together with other pockets so you've got a combination that's greater and partly because you could start using them for quite small um for discounts very quickly so for the the customer it's a very clear and clean value proposition you know 
use your points finally for the companies they have to do their homework and decide you know they already do the homework by deciding how many points to give in general in what situations and uh and well that's what they do already i don't think they have to do any other calculation with void points they just once right. they they agree they are in the game and they, they don't change the rules right um so yeah i mean there can be losers and winners in it depends on on the companies how they behave right uh could could it be a case where the customer is also a loser because they say okay i gave out i gave away ten thousand points from which i could have used tomorrow I didn't know i was flying now i know and now i have the boy points and i conditions kind of changed now if i go if i use the okay maybe the question is this uh i have ten thousand miles so what, what is a good number of miles hundred thousand right now ten thousand yeah, is not right so be, let's say i have a hundred thousand miles on Qatar Airlines. I'm not gonna fly Qatar Airlines for like two years. They're gonna expire the miles. Let me change them for for void points so I can use them everywhere. And then next day, oh my god, I have to fly to Bangkok. I need Qatar Airlines uh, miles. I don't have them anymore. Okay, I'm gonna use my void points, and I'm gonna get a bit less. Is that a case or no? Well, that could happen. Yeah, that, that could happen. Right. I think probably you would. Um... There'd be a fairly small delta on the value that you would small one perceive right. between the two options. So I paid for flexibility and I lost a little bit. All right. Yeah, All right. but but for sure, I mean, I, I don't want to gloss this over. Right, you are right in that sense. In that particular situation, the the consumer will probably get slightly, and it is slightly less value for their points because they've converted them. Um, and I, I think people are generally used to that, right? Because normally when you it's like converting a currency and you've lost something in the exchange margin yeah. right? or you exchange you exchange your uh, euros to dollars and you hold on to your euros for a month. And then, you know, something major happens in the US, the dollar improves in strength and now the euro is not worth as much anymore. And, you know, that people understand. Okay. That. Um, I, th I think the actual situation is fairly unlikely because I don't think many people will move points if they think they have a serious chance to use them in the foreseeable future. Um, I think the people who are you... No, the, the, the case I made was that, that you were planning not to use them this way. Yeah, I mean, you you actually, you gave me a use case that I hadn't thought of before, which is... Uh, well, it's who, a corner case. I'm just trying no, to... It's, it's a good me. case. Someone who's got enough points, but just doesn't anticipate using on that right. airline or hotel chain, and therefore they move them into a more flexible pot where they can use them on anything. That's That's a good use case. Our, our business plan assumes mostly people are just moving their points out because they just haven't got enough. You've got small little pockets. Yeah, that's the main. Plus, flexibility does cost. I mean, in any situation. So, if you know, a, a, a refundable booking is more expensive yeah. than a non-refundable. So, okay. Yeah, exactly. So, we we could now move on a bit, like the the user experience. So, first of all, I I think um, I'm pretty sure you don't need to have a wallet as a user, right? Uh, to um, to have these tokens. Correct, correct. Yeah. We, um, so so we we provide what to the user feels like a wallet, right? Um, so yeah. we we provide them with an account with points in it, um, and because these points are not tradable, right? You, you can't you can't like you can't go to Coinbase and try to sell them or anything like that, right? The the, the actual these are the discount points that people aggregate um then there's, there's no need for a wallet now we, we do have a token we haven't launched it yet but when, when we get to tge we will have a token and that will be fully tradable floating in value um just like most tokens so the points are not an erc20 or they are but it's behind the scenes uh, and they are but there's, they're, they're effectively operating a little bit like a, a, a non-tradable stable coin right so they're, they're behind but the they scene. are on chain or not the points they're on chain exactly on chain but yeah. through i i can't get them out of i can't put them on my Met metamask correct i can't because you don't give me access so it's like not having a token okay yeah. uh so they represent the value and and the token what does it do then the token then uh, is, is sort of the other side of Void. So, firstly, it's you know like any token, it's a, effectively a ownership part ownership of Void, uh, and, and and therefore has to, to some degree control. Like it gives you some control of where if you've got enough of them, um, like any token. 
Um, it has a fluctuating value, so some people may be interested in that. Um, and also it has a better exchange. If you, you can exchange the token, the, the void coin, into points, and you can get better better points for that. Is this a fixed exchange? Uh, no, it's a verbal exchange because the value of the point is fixed and the value of the token is floating. The token is on the market, so it has the a token on the market. Token, exactly. But uh, the token, the points being somehow centralized. Uh, how do you define the value of the token versus the the point? Um, I mean, we'll we'll we will launch the token in in the same way that, like I'm guessing, most Web three organizations do, whereby you've you've got a uh, expected valuation, fully diluted valuation of the enterprise Voy, uh, Voy, Voy Travel Inc. Right. Um, and you've got a number of tokens, some of which have been pre-sold, and you've got some that you're going to put on the market, and some you're going to keep in in your in in your own store of tokens. Uh, and so, you know, it's division, isn't it? Right, valuation divided by all those tokens gives you the value of the token on launch day, and then the market will decide is it worth that much or not. Yeah, this is the price of the token, but what what yeah. is the exchange with the point? Like, is it one token, one point, or uh, no, 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 it's not because the point. The point always has the same value, and the, the point is has has a, I mean, it's a fraction of a cent, right? Um, so there's a fee, there's a the, the the point value is expressed in 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 fiat in dollars, let's say. Correct, correct, because it's, it's going to be translated into um, a discount. Okay, so let's say that is uh, I don't know one cent. Exactly. A uh, point is one cent, and let's say that your token launches at one cent too, just to yep. give an example, and then yep. the token. So I can exchange 10 tokens for 10 points at that point, right? At that point, you can. And then, and then if the token you, doubles in price, I can you, exchange, I can get more points. That, you get, you'll get 20. Yeah, exactly. Oh, it's like a stable coin, the point then. Okay. Correct. Exactly what it is, yes. Yeah. All right. So I can I can bet and, and say, okay, it's going to go up so I can get more points because then I can actually buy points with the token. Exactly. Yes, yeah, you can. Okay. So you, I'm betting on... I was going to say I'm betting on the company to be successful. Actually, I'm betting on the token being successful or being uh, the price growing up with soft, often are very different things. So your token goes up 10x. I, I'm going to basically have lots of points uh, yep. and I can travel much cheaper yep. and vice versa. Of course, if it crashes, then then I can't. But yeah, clear. Yep. All of that is exactly true. Yeah. Okay. So let's go to the DeFi part DeFi aspect of VoIP because it's pretty heavy in DeFi. Uh, Me protocol has DeFi in a way. Yeah, it has. They have yeah. the pools. Uh, but you go a bit deeper. Um, you're more DeFi native in a way. Uh, so let, let's let's hear about that. Yeah. So, you know, I, I think this starts from a theory that, you know, you've, you've expounded very eloquently, which is that sort of travel is the next frontier for um the world of web3 and and arguably for much of the world of defi and, and and we actually call it travel fi um and part of the defi ecosystem that exists right now is the idea of staking right um now the web3 uh experts out there uh listening to your podcast today will be probably fairly well versed in staking it is um uh, it's a huge industry now within Web3 alone. I, I think there is $300, $400 billion of staked asset, crypto asset right now. Um, a large slice of that is uh, ETH, right? So yeah, yeah. Um, when I, if I was trying to explain it, you know, to my mum, then I would say it's a little bit like a deposit account in a bank, right? You you put a hundred pounds or for her, I mean she lives in England, hundred euros for us into your bank account, and you tell them it's you. And they say you can't touch it for six months, and they'll pay you some interest on that. Um, at its basis, you could think of staking like that. It has grown yep. more complicated derivatives off that, and some derivatives make it look like you're actually still able to take the money out and use it, even though it's supposed to be sitting in the bank. But anyway. Yeah. Staking and and you know, therefore liquid staking um, do allow you to effectively 
surrender an asset for a period of time and get a yield, like an interest rate, get a yield on that asset. And it's very widespread now. Um, and people are not just staking their own tokens, they're staking the big the big name tokens, the um, ETH, et cetera. We can participate in that just like anybody else can. There's well-known mechanics for us to be able to accept people staking tokens with VOI on, on, onto VOI travel um, and give them a yield in, in tokens. But what we've got as a super advantage is we can juice up the yield that we give them by adding points, by adding travel points. And so people could say, hey, I'm going to stake all of these tokens, some, some uh, other, uh, you know, whatever liquid token I want to stake. Uh, I'm going to put it aside for six months. I'm going to earn this much cryptocurrency value. But, oh, I'm getting some points as well. So I'm going to get a vacation as well as that. You know, I'm going to get a trip to Hawaii on top of all of the things that I've already got from staking uh, this, this asset. Um, and that's a great advantage for us. Um, and because we have the control over that points pool, it's much easier for us to do that. Right. This is uh, this is the first time I've, I've read about your project. I said, this is fantastic. Uh, it's fantastic. At the same time, it's hard for most people to understand what's going on here. Uh, only people who have actually staked and restaked can understand this. I mean, everybody can understand it, but I personally don't understand things un unless I do them. And luckily, I did it. So let, let me uh, let me explain the journey of of a person getting from ETH to to Marriott. <laughs> I was looking for a hotel name with ETH in, in itself, something more, or, or a country with ETH. You have to think about it. So I have ETH in my wallet. And they stay there and I just hope they go up. I, you know, right, Vitalik, do your work and make me rich, right? That's that's level one. Level two is like I take my ETH and I stake them. And I can stake them in two ways. One, I have 32 of them, like I have a hundred thousand dollars, more or less. And I, I have a node, a machine in my house, and I stake them and I start earning yield. That's for the few, I would say now. I could lead a lot of money, you have to be very technical, etc. The other one is I stake them in uh, protocols like Lido, uh, liquid staking protocols that you mentioned that. So I take my ETH. I think you can do it even from Ledger Live now or something like that. So I take it, I basically stake them. I put them in a contract and I can touch them. And in exchange, I get another token. Let's say in Lido, it's called STETH, right? Uh, I stake them. So they are there. Mm, for as long as I want. It's not locked. I can take them out anytime. But for the period I keep them, I get the same yield the other staker get. Like I get some yield, 2%, 3%, minus a small commission for Lido, which is basically telling me, don't bother with the theory to eat. Don't bother with the machine in your home. We take care of that. So I took my eat, I put them in a contract, and I start making 2 or 3%. That's where until... A couple of years ago, it, it stopped. And you will say, like, my ETH will grow in price, but also I'm going to get more ETH, All right? Then the last, I don't know when this has started, maybe a year ago, a bit more, Eigenlayer comes out and says, take this staked ETH, ST ETH, this token, this, this uh, basically a receipt you got from Lido, and stake it again. And this in, in TradFi, in Wall Street, is called rehypothecation. Right, so you are increasing your risk because now it's two smart contracts, which could be hacked by North Koreans, and uh, but now you're making again extra yield on that. It's a bit weird, um, but okay, it kind of makes sense because you are with that with that eat liquid eat, you are helping another protocol protect um, protect the protocol itself. Right, okay. So again, now I'm doing this you know, shining guns with the crypto, but you know, this is crypto, so we do those things. Now, a simpler way would, and again, I'm I'm betting all on ETH going up because I can get 3% a year, but if ETH loses 50%, you know, and this happened many times, you say, oh my God, I was thinking I was making three, five, ten percent but if he lost 50%, I'm still down. You're saying, uh, with, Voy, with Voy, Voy Travel, you could say, okay, and that that's the genius of it. I really like it. Um, and it's not only Void. There's other companies doing that, but it's, it's, I really love this part. Take your ETH, 
stake them in Lido or whatever, get this other token called STE. I'm sorry, with Void, you don't have to go through Lido. You can go directly. Either. You, you could stake ETH or STE. All right. Take your ETH, which are sleeping in your wallet, stake them in Void, and don't get 3% or 5% ETH. We keep them, but we give you points. So these points allow you to get to the Marriott, basically, right? So instead of risking everything on ETH, you're actually cashing out. You're spending the um, the yield, which otherwise you would not even have gotten, right? And that's the best case. And there's other cases which I'm already getting, I'm already staking and restaking, and now I'm saying, okay, do I prefer to get extra ETH or Marriott? Yeah. Sorry for the long explanation, but I think this was due. But the magic of it is that, especially if you don't stay here, eat, now you can acquire tokens, in this case from Vo Vo Void Travel, but other companies too, without actually buying tokens. It's like ICO 2.0. ICO before you had to sell your eat to get tokens, which probably went to zero. Now you don't have to sell your eat. You just have to park them somewhere else and say, you know what, I'm going to get void tokens. Maybe they go up, maybe not, maybe I use points, etc. So the risk is very limited compared to an ICO. And that's the magic of it. And I don't know why it's not bigger yet, because it's a great way for to acquire, you know, assets. Yeah, I'm, I'm stopping yeah. here because, <laughs> but it's, it's really good. It's, I really like this. Thank you. Yeah. Now, of course, it's limited to the few people who can do all these technical things. And unfortunately, it's not many people. But as you said, there's a lot of money. Few people with a lot of money. Yeah, you know, I mean, I... 30 billions in, in restaked stuff already. So 300 billion. 300 yeah, but the, the restaked, I meant the like okay, eigenlayer yeah. and stuff. Restake, yeah. Right. yeah. Still... Of course, you have to look at the number of, of the yield and not how much money is staked. That, that's what you're after, right? So your market here, your TAM is the yield. So Amazing. as there are you know, 10 billions in the yield, you can get a billion of them or whatever. So, yeah. Yeah, still a lot. Really cool. So very, very advanced DeFi in a way. So this is not DeFi summer stuff. This is really the, the, the latest and applied to travel. So exactly. Again, exactly. Beautiful. Yeah. And, and, and I guess that's where, you know, when we're talking about the fashions of um, the world of crypto, now this, you're starting to hit into real world assets right so you, you know for for in, instead of cashing out for another token instead of cashing out for a different yield you're actually getting something that you can enjoy in life um you get your you know vacation in bali or your flight to new york um or your hotel in paris it doesn't matter right? it, it's also incredibly interesting in general this because you know we always say we're going to sell at the top and then we don't so we lose money at the end, right? In this way, you say, you know, by by design, you know, even if it crashes tomorrow, by, you know, I, I got something out of it. If you use it in the try, if you spend the tokens, uh, the, the points, of course, instead yeah. of counting on yourself, like, yeah, I'm going to sell and I start selling when it grows and, and then not doing it. Now I, you're actually going to get something uh, in the real world. Real yeah. world asset, okay. yeah. If, if you once you've got the points right even if there's a crash the points are stable value anyway so there could be a market crash and then the points you can still get your your holiday in your hotels right? because you get points you don't get tokens right with staking right. get points yeah cool all right and you get real money you got eat now okay it's about your game here to, to sell those eat when is it's a good time but you are yeah. a company so you can be you can focus on this more than retail is getting distracted by AI meme coins and stuff, right? Mm, yeah. Very good. Very yeah. nice. Yeah. I mean, generally, what we will try to do is to exchange those yields that we're getting into USDC fairly quickly. Very we quickly. Have to yeah. underwrite the points that are going to be so, like, if we give a little bunch speculate. of points, then mm. eventually, then a, a big proportion of that invoice when it comes in from the hotel in Bali has got to be settled in dollars and we need something to settle that with. So we'll. Right. That point. And then you, you you can stake those USDT USDC for extra yield yourself. Yep. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Great. Right. Is there anything else I kind of missed here, or we didn't talk about? You want to talk about? 
Well, I guess I guess so. The other thing that we think is interesting, you know, so if I think sort of like the first exciting opportunity for Voy is just getting people to use their unused currency and, and buy more trips, right? That's a, that's good. The second exciting thing, and you rightly said, is is the whole world of staking and how people can turn um, effectively crypto yields into vacations uh, without giving up their tokens. And then the third thing I think is really interesting is as Voy gets bigger and bigger and more and more people start to use it, then it becomes the de facto um, incentive currency for the world of Web3. And so other Web3 organizations that want to incentivize a behavior can give out Voy points. And so, um, and, and you know, that's, that's a path that was well trodden in in the old world, wasn't it? You know, um, you use your uh, credit card and the credit card gives you, you know, one Avios on every dollar you sp or every euro you spend, or you use your uh, mobile phone contract and you're getting bonus um, miles and more points, whatever. Uh, we think that that is a, a well understood model that will carry across to Web3. And when companies are looking to say, okay, right, we want to give some, incentive out but we don't we don't want to have to create a loyalty program of our own and manage our own pools of currency that's that's not the business we're in right uh and so therefore we want to give out currency that people will see is um is very motivational and as void gets bigger and has a bigger footprint then it becomes better known it becomes more motivational and so in, in the third stage you get companies using voy as an incentive well beyond the boundaries of voy itself I think we forgot to present you more properly, like because you, you you know what you're talking about in a way. So maybe can you remind us a bit what you did in the past? Ah, oh, yeah, mm. we did forget to me. Yeah, so um, look, I'm I'm basically a career travel guy. Uh, I've been in the tra world of travel for about thirty years. Uh, I started my career at British Airways as a management trainee, straight out of university, um, and and stayed with it through different positions in the airline game, uh, worked with startups uh, that were attached to travel in the travel world, worked with mid cap companies, but all the time I've been working with airlines and travel companies um, and, you know, had had some great fun and great experiences and, and uh, some good executive positions with lots of learning that came with them. And so I've, I've got to a point now in, in my older years where I really do understand how travel works how the industry works and, and all the pipes that kind of connect it. Yeah, because there is always this conundrum, right? So Web3 and travel, who's going to disrupt travel, the travel industry? People from coming from outside of it, as often happens, like Airbnb, they mm -hmm. were completely mm -hmm. out of travel, or it's going to be from people in the travel industry, and nobody knows what's going to happen. But certainly what something which often happens is that People coming from out of the travel industry have a view, a naive view of this world. They think it's like a hundred times simpler than it actually is. They don't know the difficulties and all the dynamics. Uh, again, this uh, ignorance sometimes can really allow you to think business models nobody in the travel industry would even dream of because we know where we know they are impossible. You need somebody to come from outside and do something which is impossible which suddenly is possible because things have changed, right? Yeah. On the other hand, somebody coming from the travel industry as yourself uh, is able to understand DeFi in this case as anybody else, because you know DeFi is new for, for all of us, and and find some model which, which can work in the travel industry. So in a way, the risk in void travel is not on the travel side. You 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 can assess the risk of your model. Uh, DeFi, it's pretty simple at the end. I mean, it, the, the fact that DeFi simply works as intended because everything is transparent and on on, on smart contracts removes all the risk. Of course, there are risks in DeFi. We know it, but they are much easier to to evaluate. Even if you are not a, you know, somebody who's been in DeFi since the beginning, right? Yeah, while the, the, to, to acquire this knowledge and perspective in the travel industry doesn't take a couple of years, it takes much longer. So yeah, 
I, I just wanted to ask you this because you know it, it it does it gives depth to to your to your ideas basically it, it yeah I think, I think there's another dimension to the kind of characterization of you know insiders versus outsiders which is to, to what extent uh have the people involved got a kind of disruptive mindset and um mm -hmm. i'm lucky i've always had that I've, I've spent most of my career in sort of like the the sharper edge of changes within organization and transformations and way back god well, well, go, going as far back as the 2000s i was leading the digital transformation at british airways and you know we were having to effectively sacrifice sacred cows all over the place there are many many things that people said no you you can never change that and and we did um okay. but it was more the belief in the change and the willingness to embrace new technologies that were coming along and saying oh this technology looks like it could allow us to make this change we've always wanted to make without getting too carried away and thinking well this technology could do anything uh, because generally the technologies can't do anything if you had to bet five years from now, 10 years from now, when some big uh, crypto based or crypto influenced travel startup becomes really important in the travel industry, if you had to bet if that comes from travel experts or crypto experts, what would you bet? Or what would you say about that? Is this even a good bet? Yeah, I think I'm probably not neutral. I, I, I would say that it will come from teams who are effectively marriage of the both right you'll you'll get mm, like yours who learn like to work together mm. um okay. with a pe bunch of people who know the business and know the industry and a bunch of people who really understand the trajectory and the possibilities that web3 gives us and between them they come up with a great idea um and and they execute it right because the that, that's 90 percent of it the, the great idea is only the first step mm. the execution of it is the tricky bit how how would you see the travel industry ten years from now? Uh, what changes can we expect in your opinion? I mean, I think I think the growth of the travel industry is fairly predictable. It's been it's been on a sort of you know globally you know four to eight percent growth path, something like that, for many years. There's nothing to indicate to me that it will change. Um, I think the nature of people's travel, where they want to go, the experiences they want when they get there, those those change a bit, but again, more the same than different. Uh, how do they buy it? I think with that will change, right? Where can you buy your travel from? Uh, how what will you use to pay for it? Uh, how you can prove that it's yours, right? That's that's an interesting question, right? Like now, pretty much I have to prove that I am going to match up something called a booking with something called a credit card and something called a passport. Um, if you think about it, all three of those things are up for grabs in Web3, aren't they, right? Like identity plus payment plus ownership. Um, Web3 could just run a train through that. And so that's mm -hmm. really, I think, the, the exciting territory. Um, and then I think there's other bits around travel that probably have not yet been tackled um that the, the touch on the rest of our life as well and, and probably for me the biggest one is sustainability right like people are getting more concerned about sustainability and travel and web3 could play a huge 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 role in that because you know people want to people care about it and so as people care about it they start saying okay well i'll buy some offsets right i, I, I want to I want to feel okay about the fact I've just taken this vacation, so I'll spend another hundred euros on buying offsets that offsets the, the carbon impact, or, or however much it turns out to be. It may turn out to be a thousand, but whatever. How do we track that? Like, really? Hmm. Did, did did I buy offsets? Were the off offsets created? Was the thousand um, dollars worth of uh, carbon, um, which which might be anything from I don't know five to fifty tons of carbon was it was it captured was it avoided i don't know now blockchain is a fabulous technology for that i mean this is this is ledger land isn't it right and so i think that that part of travel could get a lot better and a lot more robust with web3 yeah the issue with this is always 
how you know the data has to be recorded on chain but you need to know that this data is real because yeah it stays it's permanent it's immutable blah 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 but yep. if the data in the first place is fake it's completely useless so it's pretty hard to do even with blockchain um, yeah. but i'm sure we find ways i mean if we really want to we find ways uh okay what about ai are you a little bit interested are you doing something do you see this uh, changing your startup or impacting your startup and travel in general? I mean, probably. I, I'm going to be honest, we haven't given a lot of thought to it at Roy. It, it would be great for us to get more um, accurate about how we um, target the activities of Roy um, and be able to act on the data that we start to gather and AI will, will help us with that for sure. Um, I'm not a big fan of trying to make your normal startup look like an AI startup just to chase funding and valuation. I think it's kind of nonsense and, and it's going to run out in the next year or two anyway. Everyone's going to realize that's a, a bubble. Uh, so I'm more keen for us to stick to, well, what, what's our real value or real proposition and, and Make sure we double down on that. Okay. All right. Is there anything else we want to talk about? Anything we, we may have skipped? I think we covered it. We're, we're excited. We're, we're soft launching um, in November. So we'll, people will be able to aggregate their currency and uh, start. So no, November, we can November. start getting, like putting our points in the platform and getting getting boy points november. that will happen in november yeah so if you if you uh if you go to voidtravel.com right now and and just register your email then as soon as uh, we launch that ability to aggregate your points to bring your points together and spend them um we'll let you know and and, and when i say it's soon it's it's really I, I would guess now three weeks away depending assuming the last bit of qa goes well three weeks Okay. So really, I remember at the conference you, you were sharing a QR code. Uh, is this something still working? Like uh, you were getting some points? Yep, that or... still works. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So you you get what if you what, what do you have to do to get something? <laughs> Please explain this one. So we I, I, some of the conferences we've given people a sort of bonus amount of uh points. So okay. We can, okay. Like we can we can we could certainly make sure that everyone that listens to your podcast gets a bonus amount of points when they go to Void. Easy peasy. All right, so you send me a link or something, and I'm gonna put it in the description. Okay, cool, yeah. fantastic. So, some extra, some free points to, to exactly. travel. Good, very good. Great, Simon. I think it was pretty, pretty smooth. Um, I yeah. hope we were both clear, simple, and at the same time deep. I think we accomplished that. Uh, very exciting. I can only, you know. Um, Let's see what happens in November. So we start playing with uh, with Boy on on the platform, and uh, and good luck with everything. Thank you, thank you, Luca. Thanks for having me here on the podcast. Really enjoyed it. Great conversation. All right, thank you so much. Bye, Simon. Okay. Bye, bye, bye. -bye. And we're done. Thank you for listening to this episode. For more insights, follow me on Twitter at Tripluca, T-R-I-P-L-U-C-A. If you enjoy my podcast and want to support it, head on to podcast.webtreeintravel.com, tree is a digit, and mint an NFT. If you want to sponsor it, you can do it at the same page. I will mention you in the podcast and your name will appear on all donation NFTs for a while. Thank you, and ciao.